Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to start this brief speech with a phrase used by Professor Alejandro Haddad, who we awarded an honorary doctorate from the walk yesterday, and who will speak after me. His words were, in health, there will, be never, there, there will never be enough resources while we all fight individually. Paying heed to this call, a call that echoes that of Dumas Three Musketeers, the Vox Health Center has, has made collaboration one of its strong points. Today, at this conference, which aims to be the first of many successful meetings, the speakers and attendees representing our international partners from Norway, Canada, and uh, Colombia, we will be able to share a forum and debates with professionals from the walk, all united by the same belief that sharing is the best way to build together, to connect and to multiply our individual potential. In the same way that today's conference seeks to share the experiences and research in e-health and e-well-being of the respective specialists, the little over 20 years of the walk's history have been characterized for aiming for and achieving this ideal of collaboration, connection, multiplication in all fields, and above all, in the fields of training and education. <clears throat> Designed for a networked world, the walk grasped right from the start the disruptive potential of the internet. Without sacrificing the generation of knowledge, the promotion of research, or pushing the boundaries of technology, we took on and stressed our role as a node. Because while we accept that knowledge is no longer exclusively held by universities, but, but shared and dispersed from operating theaters to museums or companies or individual creators, artists, it's, it is now more pressing than ever that we act as the link to connect, multiply, facilitate, or join. If we want networks, if we believe in networks, we need to look at nodes. If we want to create a university of the future, we can't limit ourselves to emulating formulas from the past. And this means looking to networks, but also looking again at education and at health, to overturn certain assumptions that have been shown to be ineffective and replace them with new visions that foster citizens' autonomy. As the English economist John Maynard Keane said, if things change, if the world evolves, then our response and opinions must change with them, must adapt. Without adaptation, there is no improvement, just stagnation. Let's not fool ourselves. We are because we evolve. When the work designed its learning model, many people thought that the technology was the decisive element without realizing that the internet was merely the means. Because that which makes us different was and still is found in our placing the student at the center. Thus, the classroom is designed not for the teaching staff or the contents or the university as an institution, Instead, everything is designed in terms of the student. The student understood as a central focus of a process that aims to train them and provide them with skills. Simple, but disruptive. The whole model is based on the abilities, needs, and potential of the student. A unique and simultaneously global approach. Relatively speaking, e-health is also facing a similar revolution placing the citizen at the center, looking to educate them, and promoting an understanding of health that goes beyond ailments and takes into account the illness and stresses the importance of well-being. Again, with technology at our side as a precise tool to help us to do so. This is just as important as collaboration and exchange, technology and collaboration to provide a new vision and a new approach. Without doubt, this is a good way to start to make that which appears to be this conference's subtitle a reality. 
It says, a paradigm shift in health. As German physicist Max Planck said, uh, said from uh, a new paradigm, he said, does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but rather because its opponents eventually die and a new generation grows up that is familiar with it. It would be marvelous and a clear sign of success if our new paradigm can convince the skeptics and simultaneously look after their health and improve their well-being. Thank you very much to everyone. was introducing Professor Haddad, so uh, <laughs> uh, sorry for this uh, lapsus. Uh, so Professor Haddad, is, uh, the floor is yours. We all know Professor Haddad, um, and it's a great pleasure to have him with us. Uh, the university is really honored that uh, he can uh, be here and, uh, and help our university to make this strategic move forward. Thank you, Professor Haddad. Okay. Well, 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 here we are. <clears throat> As you can see uh, on your program, I will be talking about the pandemic of health. But before they take this, I want to make the most of this meeting slide. First international research conference on e-health and e-well-being. Hmm. When would e-health succeed? What's our success? I guess that all of us are interested in e-health, otherwise we would not be here. When could we declare victory? I said, we did our job. What success? What is success? Sorry? No e. No e. Exactly. How can we get rid of the E? Exactly. So it's like International Women's Day. Why? Because women are screwed. Okay? We, need, we need to have an international day focused on women because we have a problem with gender equity. If we need meetings on e-health, it's because we have an, an issue. Okay? We need to talk about it. So what would it take not to have a, ever again a meeting on e-health? I think that should be our goal. Okay. So when would that happen? When technology becomes normal in relation to health? Okay. How would we know that that happened? You see, a few years ago, uh, when we created the Center for Global E-Health Innovation in Toronto, people would ask us, What's that e-health? Okay, we're talking about almost 20 years ago. An e-health innovation, what's that? And I used to ask people, I remember the days, who has a cell phone? Hmm? And a few hands would be up. Who uses the internet? A few hands will go up. And then over the years, now, the penetration of digital technologies has been such that now we have a big challenge to do research, comparing people who use technology with people who don't have access to technology. We missed an opportunity for decades to collect data prospectively to try to understand the value of technology in health. Now, it's who doesn't have a mobile phone in this room? You see, no hands up. Hmm? And this is happening all over the place. So how can we attribute impacts on health of digital technologies when we don't know the line beyond which we can call something an e-health innovation? Because if I have access to Facebook, and I just use Facebook, could we consider just an account on, on Facebook an e-health? intervention, if it has impact on my health. 
You see, now we have big methodological challenges okay, that we didn't have 10 years ago. Because before, we would introduce a telephone in a consulting room or create a platform to allow people to communicate. And that was very different from what people would have normally in their lives. Now, digital technologies are so pervasive. They are everywhere that it's extremely difficult and possibly impossible to know when our work begins and when it ends. Hmm? So having said that, I would like to propose something crazy. Yeah? Apparently crazy. Which is to make health a complete pandemic. Because if everybody is healthy, we don't need to talk about medicine. The target here is medicine, which has been dominating the discourse on health for too long. And as some of you have heard me, health is too important to be left in the hands of medical people. Okay? So let's develop this idea. Please feel free to interrupt me at any point. Okay. And if you want to talk about the methodological challenges of, of research on e-health, I would be more than happy to, to discuss that either during my presentation or later on. But we are not devoting enough time to that. Okay. So here we go. What is the role of digital technologies in enabling us to complete a pandemic of health. And most people get shocked when I say it's time for a pandemic of health. In fact, they may think I'm crazy, really, and I am, um, but not in this sense. My next question, when they say pandemic of health, what's that? I said, what's a pandemic? What's a pandemic? What's a pandemic? Let's interact. <laughs> Are we recording this? OK. Everybody has it. Who would like a pandemic of health? Okay. Hopefully everybody, because pandemic comes from pan, which means all, and the most people. So if there is a pandemic that we would wish to have, it's a pandemic of health. But people say, OK. But we have always connected this with diseases. Okay. When did we use the word pandemic for the first time? It was in the year 1666 in relation to the uh, plague of London that killed about 100,000 people at the time. And it was confused with uh, an epidemic because it was just in London, or at best in the UK, in the United Kingdom. Okay. But this man, uh, Gideon Harvey, was the first to introduce the word pandemic. And since then, we have been associating the word pandemic with infectious diseases. In the year 2009, um, the World Health Organization was embarrassed because we had the H1N1 outbreak and the WHO declared it a pandemic. And then very quickly, thanks to digital technologies, it was known that people behind that decision had economic interests. Billions of dollars were made by some companies that produced antiviral interventions. And governments were forced to put a lot of money to buy pharmaceutical products on the backs of the declaration of a pandemic by the WHO. Okay. And people said, why did the WHO consider H1N1 a pandemic? Is it really a big problem or not? What we know is that a lot of people are making a lot of money okay, on the backs of, of the pandemic. So there was this paper published uh, in the Journal of Infectious Diseases in in 2009, pretty rushed through uh, the publication process 
to try to contain the criticism. And they reviewed um, every publication they could find on the use of the word pandemic. And the, the following year, the WHO had to issue a statement to clarify what it meant by pandemic. And as you can see, it required a lot of backpedaling. I think this is a shameful definition. Because it says, or conceptualization. It says a pandemic can be declared when there are affected communities in at least two countries within one region and at least one country in a different region of the United Nations or the World Health Organization. Wow, three countries and a pandemic? Hmm. I thought it was the entire world, huh? No, no, just with two within one continent or one region and another one. That's a pandemic. So, this thing created an opportunity, that conceptualization or attempt at describing what the pandemic is, to make a case for health to be more pandemic than anything else. So that created an opportunity. Okay? If we have been using this language and mobilizing the world behind something negative, what if we try to do it for something more attractive to humanity? Okay. So um, this work that I'm going to share with you builds on an experience that started in 2008, personal experience, that made me realize that at least I didn't know anything about health after 20 years of university education, four medical specialties, two doctorates, titles that had health in them, I realized as a patient that I didn't know what health meant. And many of you may have seen some of our work on the meaning of health. But we created the foundations for this work on a pandemic of health without knowing, we didn't have a clue at the time that this is where we were heading when the British Medical Journal uh, allowed us, and it was myself and Laura O'Grady who was doing her postdoctoral post fellowship with me, we invited the world to join in a conversation, a global conversation on what we meant by health. Okay. Because what we had until that point for 60 years was the WHO so-called WHO definition of health. Okay. So this discussion, this conversation that used every possible digital medium we could find at the time, uh, started in 2008 and it took three years. So in 2011, we published it, it made the cover of the British Medical Journal and it was timed very carefully to be available to people attending the United Nations General Assembly of 2011, which was the second time when the United Nations had devoted the entire General Assembly to a health-related issue. Before, the first time was AIDS, HIV AIDS. And on um, the Assembly of 2011, it was chronic non-communicable diseases because it was perceived as a threat to humanity. So we said, let's poke the beast by presenting an alternative to how we are perceiving health until now. Okay? So <clears throat> I want to pause here on purpose, because the question is, uh, and the question was at that time too, how healthy are we? Okay? And before I share with some of you who have not seen the conceptualization of health that we produced in three years, I want to do an experiment here with us. I'm going to divide the room in two halves. Yeah. Right here, if you can see my arm, you're in the middle. So there is one group on this side, there is a group on this side. So 
for this side and pay attention. Raise your hand if you have complete physical, mental, and social well-being on this half. <laughs> if you are wearing glass glasses, you don't qualify. If you want to pee, you cannot qualify. If you didn't sleep well last night, you don't qualify. You don't have complete physical, mental. Hmm? If you're worried about paying your bills, you don't qualify, OK? <laughs> because you don't have complete physical, mental, and social well-being. Raise your hand. This half. So you're all ill. OK? So let's see this half over here. Raise your hand if you're, and please keep it up, if your health is poor, fair, good, very good, excellent, <laughs> not sure. <laughs> OK, OK. So let's go again. Poor, fair, good, very good, excellent. OK. Who is not sure? OK, three, four, five, six hands. How many people in this room? Quant OK, 100 and something, about 10 hands. Let's say that uh, about 20% of people are not sure. OK, the rest are healthy. How come nobody here? Hmm? So let's see. Raise your hands over here. If your health is poor, Fair, good, very good, excellent. Not sure, about two hands, but okay, that's fine, that's fine, you see? How come if that three minutes ago you were not healthy? <laughs> the first one, this complete physical, mental, and social well-being is the, U, the, the WHO definition that condemned us all humans not to be healthy, basically. So raise your hand if your health is good, very good or excellent, in general, please, OK? The majority of us is healthy, OK? We are, most of us are healthy, according to how we feel. The question is, how much can we respect what we feel? And who has the legitimacy, the authority, to declare a person healthy? Should it be a medical doctor like me who has not been taught anything about health, really? Barely about disease, and now I am asking the question, what is a disease? And we really don't know what a disease is. And this can be either very scary or very exciting. Okay? Because we have been betting on disease and we haven't stopped to say, what is a disease? Think about it, what's a disease? Mm -hmm. And there have been interesting studies shown that showing that we 60 conditions that have been regarded as diseases when a group of about 4,500, 4,500 people, medical professions, uh, medical professionals, uh, nursing professionals, members of the public and parliament, members of the parliament, when they have been asked about these 60 conditions, there is no agreement on anything, not even breast cancer, as to whether it is a disease or not. So this is a time of opportunity, because we have been assuming a lot of things for a long time, that we know what is health, what is disease, and that we know what we are doing. But what if we don't know what we have been doing? What if there is an opportunity to reimagine even how we talk about things, how we think about things, that we might be able to reinvent everything? So, most people here are healthy. I would say at least 80% of the people in this room. So, what is health? Was the question we were trying uh, to answer for these three years. And despite the fact that we said we cannot define anything, that we had produced a conceptualization, there is a big difference between a definition and a conceptualization. Wittgenstein, the philosopher, said we cannot even define a chair. And he invited us, try to define a chair, a chair. What's a chair? Hmm? So it's better, because if you are trying to define something, when we try to define something, what we are attempting to do is to come up with a description of the entity 
that would be precise and acceptable pretty much anywhere by anybody. A conceptualization is an effort to translate an idea into words or images, knowing that it's imperfect, that it needs to evolve, that it will change, that it's the best we can do. So what we came up with was a statement, and this work was led by, by um, Dr. Huber, now she was a student at the time in the Netherlands, um, that eliminates the word condition. Health is not a condition. We said health is an ability. And this builds in the work of many other people, Ivan Illich, Sigmund Freud, others who said, okay, uh, Aaron Antonovsky, that health is the ability that we have as individuals or communities to adapt and self-manage when we face physical, mental, and social challenges. It has a lot to do with resilience. It has a lot to do with how we perceive ourselves and the world. And the fact that we use stability creates tremendous opportunities for e-health. Because we can be trained to be healthy. We can learn to be healthy. Our ability to adapt and self-manage can be reinforced, complemented. And this is something that now opens the field beyond medicine and keeps a role for medicine, not the dominant one, though. This is very threatening stuff. Okay? Now, who determines when a person is healthy? And we're not saying that medicine doesn't play a role. You can have medical issues that are reducing your ability to adapt and self-manage. Then medicine has a role. But if I have a social disease, like hunger, or as happens in many places, even here, with, with precarious work. You're having to live with your parents and your grandparents because you went to university and you cannot make a living because all you find is 300 euros a month to do something and you feel miserable. The risk is that we would give you pills, antidepressants, hmm? instead of doing something at the social level to try to fix the social illness. And we are not going to be throwing medical solutions to social problems, which is what we are doing a lot of the time. And now we are expecting a pandemic of mental illness. And we are not ready for that. And it will not be for psychiatrists to deal with that. Because what we would be seeing from medicine is the manifestations of many other issues. And, in, and to a large extent, those issues would be fueled by technology. And today, I also want to invite the audience, all of us, to think about the negative aspects of technology, because we are all in love with the gadgets. And it's almost a one-tailed, when we're talking about research, a one-tailed thing. We are only looking at the positive sides, when, in fact, technology may be doing more harm than good now, in terms of our ability to cope with the threats. Just being on Facebook, everybody seems so happy there or on Instagram, perfect lives, everybody. Why am I suck so much? Hmm? <laughs> and then we are all forced to put fake stuff there just to conform. Hmm? And we are not looking at that as e-health, because we are just focusing on apps for this, apps for that, hmm? platforms for this, platforms for that, algorithms for this, algorithms for that, machine learning, when the impact of technology on health may be greater and negative. And we are ignoring it, because that's not our thing, you see. I cannot control that stuff. So this is an opportunity for us to reflect as to the fact that this goes both ways. And that we don't control technology. Technology is being controlled by Google, Facebook, Amazon, Apple. And we are nothing. These organizations are making decisions that affect human health that are outside the regulatory framework of any country. They can do anything they want, and they are doing it. And we are not discussing the ethical implications of technology at these meetings. We are focused on the bloody gadgets, and that's a big problem. We are becoming even more useful idiots. And we think that with an app, we are going to be overriding what's happening, which is huge financial pressures underneath to make money. Market forces, market forces to suck the only thing that is left in us, which is our time. 
and turning us into products. Every time we use each of these gadgets, we are generating data that will be used to make money by somebody and then to manipulate us to make more money. And that can have huge implications on human health. So let's pay attention to those. Okay. And I hope this is useful. And anybody claiming to do something on health with technology, I dare, I challenge to use this as the main indicator. If it doesn't help us, enable us to perceive our health as good, very good, or excellent, I don't give a shit whether you call it e-health. It's not e-health, it's e-disease, it's e-behavior, it's e-whatever. And we have another risk to fall into the same trap. This is healthy because it reduces the prevalence of diabetes. Who said it reduces the prevalence of diabetes? It doesn't mean that it makes people healthier. Your intervention will make me healthier if my health, which was poor or fair, shifts to good, very good, or excellent. You may even claim that your intervention has to do with e-health if my health is good, very good, and excellent, and you enable me to stay like that, despite the challenges that I am experiencing constantly in my life. Okay? And I could stop here. I think I've said most of what I had to say. If you're focusing on gadgets, we are not looking at health as the outcome, and we are not paying attention to the biggest forces that are influencing our lives without any control. Google, Facebook, hmm? Amazon, and Apple. They are running the show, and we are puppets. And we are idiot puppets if we don't wake up and just write our little papers, get our little grants, go to our little meetings talking about little things, and give each other pats on the back and give awards to each other in nice places, which is what's following. Then we may be doing more harm than good to society, and we should disappear. Okay? This takes courage, because now we are not only going ahead in against a $9 trillion a year industry, which was the traditional pharmaceutical sector, insurance, hospital, biomedical device giants, now we are adding the biggest companies the world has ever seen that are into everybody's lives, everybody's lives. Okay. So the good news is that we consider health as the ability to adapt, blah, blah, and that people, I have the authority to declare myself healthy, and then if I have a disease, then I would like to have a companion enabling me to deal with that, who is not going to challenge how I feel, who will respect me, because we don't respect people either. We label people and that's it. Okay. Then health, People who feel healthy go beyond two countries in a region of the World Health Organization and in at least one country in another region because in every country in the world there are people who feel healthy. So health is already pandemic. Okay? And we have a database with two million people from 116 countries who have reported the levels of self their own levels of health. And we aggregated them and we have looked at blogs and all that stuff. The rule of thumb now, because we are cleaning these databases, they have different structures, different tools, the whole thing. Okay, we are trying to standardize as much as we can, is that about 72% of humans who have been asked who are part of these national databases consider themselves to have health at the good, very good, or excellent category. And not even the Black Death that we called a pandemic worldwide, not even the Spanish influenza reached this level. Not even obesity now, not even diabetes now. And we call diabetes and obesity a pandemic. At best, 20% of humanity. If you add overweight, 
40%, make it 50%, 72%. The only thing that seems to be beating health as a pandemic is dental caries, cavities. That apparently if we give a, a dentist the opportunity to open our mouth, 100% of adults will have dental cavities. And dentists are not paying attention to cavities, the prevention of, of, of cavities, by the way. I went to the World Dentistry Conference and gave a lecture and I showed them how the only area I have found in my life in which the number of articles is going down is the prevention of dental caries. Because they want caries to happen to do stuff and charge us money. <laughs> and they don't study caries, they don't reward the people who do research on caries and that thing. So that's a sick, and I don't want to say fucked up because it sounds horrible, okay, at a meeting like this. I really say, what the fuck? You are responsible for the mouth, and I don't understand how we left one group to be only focused on one area and call it a profession. At least justify your existence by paying attention to the biggest issue you have. Of course, they never invited me to the conference again. <laughs> and um, you wonder why. So at least 5,500 million people are healthy, and we can rank countries, we can look at regions, we are starting to look at gender, socioeconomic status. We have 40 national indicators, poverty, perception of corruption, indicators that the government generates, indicators that civil society generates. We are doing a lot of very interesting work with Kevin uh, Avin, or, or, or Wind, who is doing his doctoral work with me, and a group of people from about 10 countries now participating. But what we are seeing is things like this. In Canada, it seems that 88.4% of adults who have been surveyed over the years consider themselves healthy. That's great. 11% and a bit of Canadians don't feel healthy. What do we need to ensure that those 11%, okay, those people who are in the 11% feel healthy? 11%, hmm? that's a manageable figure. In Colombia, the data we have from 2015 is 77.6 and Spain 75.3. Which is very similar to what we got today here. Fascinating. Hmm? Very interesting. So, what happens with this 75% in Spain? What happens with the 25% remaining? And it's not the presence of disease, because we have people here even with five diseases who feel healthy. Okay? But there are some things that are starting to show up as consistent. And the saddest, the, 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 the most disturbing one is that women are really screwed up all over the place. The only country where we have found women to perceive themselves as healthier than men is Australia. In every other country, women feel less healthy than men. And by the way, less happy too, as time goes by. Women used to be happier in the 70s and 80s, now somehow, and we have about 800,000 people on these databases where we have data on happiness as well. So we're taking a look at health and happiness simultaneously or separately. Anyway, now after all this you heard, how could digital technologies help us? But help us do what? You understand? Please, during the rest of the meeting, let's think about what we are trying to achieve with the gadgets. We are the pioneers in this field. Okay? So I would say that first, we need to look at the landscape. And this is an amazing curve and from the World Bank and with data from the International Telecommunications Union. And this is the number of mobile cellular subscriptions per 100 people in the world. Straight from them. I couldn't get a nicer one, but look at this. The world, it went beyond 100% in 2016. So we have more mobile subscriptions than people in the world now. They are not evenly distributed. We have now more mobile phone subscriptions in the world than humans. Wow, okay? That creates the opportunity for us to be able to collect data from every person, and it's happening with the telephone companies and with these uh, digital uh, online social media companies. They are collecting data from everybody. We are not doing that from the academic world's perspective. We don't even have data on our own people within our own institutions. 
whether you are an insurance company, a government agency, a university, a hospital, or a clinic. We don't even know how healthy our own people are. And we are talking about bringing health to the world. Okay? So here we have an opportunity to turn each of our institutions into the foundational area from which we preach. Because we are very good at telling other people what to do. And I challenge universities, how healthy are you? Hospitals, how healthy are you? Insurance companies, how healthy are you? Hmm? Be easy. Just collect data, ask your people how healthy they feel, and do something about it. Then come to me and sell me your stuff on health. Okay? So I think we have a great opportunity here. Then we reached another milestone last year in which more than 50% of, 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 of the world was penetrated by the internet. Okay? Another milestone. We went over the 50% mark. This creates lots of interesting opportunities. We could now integrate self-rated health in health records. If not, don't call them health records, because they are not health records. If you don't have health as an indicator, you, it's not a health record. It's a medical record. It's a disease record. It's an insurance record. It's an academic record, but it's not a health record. Okay. We could harness existing resources. There are resources that are already available to a lot of people. We could be using Wikipedia to promote these kind of things, and it's already starting to happen. An alternative approach, this is the WHO de definition, focuses on avoiding definitions which demand precise descriptions of the term. Instead, following a three-year global conversation, blah, 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 health is perceived as this. Boom, we made it into Wikipedia. Wikipedia is doing the work for us. And there is a precedent on how we could use tools like Wikipedia to our advantage. The UK Cancer uh, uh, Research Group joined forces with Wikipedia, and they took editorship of every article on cancer on Wikipedia to make sure that the information is accurate and easy to understand by different audiences, using already a resource that is so we don't have to spend money on building platforms. Okay? We could use what is out there. Uh, before Wikipedia was so big, or Facebook, we had to build our own things, and this is still happening. The, the Junta de Andalusia, the Andalusian Health Ministry, uh, over, what, 12 years ago, put some resources in the creation of this Observatory of Innovative Practices for Complex Chronic Diseases, Multiple Chronic Conditions. And we created interactive maps as soon as we could get Google and all that, and we have over 1,000 innovations there, we have materials, we run MOOCs. We have now probably 20,000 people taking courses on multiple chronic conditions in, from the Andalusian School of Public Health. And we are trying to migrate these things as much as possible to other platforms so we don't need to maintain these things. We could also, for the first time in history, have a representative sample of humanity. This is one of my dreams. So anybody interested in this, let me know. Most of the surveys we have, most of the data we have, come from cross-sectional studies. We take a sample of people, and then we report on the picture. It's a photograph. We don't have a group of humans that represent 7.5 billion people engaged in a dialogue as to what we want for us as a species. Okay? To be able to learn from each other and with each other. Now we could do that. And we are identifying the top methodologists in the world who run the biggest studies to see if they are willing to join forces with us to create this group of people. Okay. We could look at new business models. It cannot be more of the same. Okay? Except probably for, for Apple, everybody, everybody else is offering stuff for free. Okay? So could we learn from them or could we use them? to get away with what we want to do, with business models that make it free to the end user. Okay. Could we shift from precision medicine, all this obsession with immortality, we are going to find with big data the cause of cancer to cure you, which is important, but for a fraction of people, to what we could call precision health. What are all those resources that are relevant to me, to me, to me, given my preferences, my values, my circumstances, to enable me to increase my ability to adapt and self-manage. 
and deal with the own challenges that life presents to me, to me. Hmm? We could go into massive individualization and the entire humanity. Hmm? We could do this for every human being on earth. And this is what motivated the creation of the Center for Globally Healthy in Toronto, uh, Globally Healthy Innovation, where we believed that we could start inviting people to create magic together. And we combined three things that together generate what we call an ecosystem for social change. Okay? Can we change society? Can we change how we live? But from civil society's perspective, can we take charge as citizens? And we combine three things. One is the notion of living labs. And this started in the 60s at MIT and other places. The second one is shared future scenarios. This is what ministries of defense do. They imagined all the catastrophes and how to prepare for that. We said, what if we use that for positive? What the ideal scenarios that we as humans would like to experience? And then nobody has critical mass to do anything meaningful anywhere, nobody. No country, no company, no university, no clinic, no insurance company. We need to join forces with each other. So we call it radical global innovation. Radical because it goes to the root of the problems. No band-aids, no tiritas. Hmm? Glocal, yeah, or, or painkillers for big cancers. Okay? Glocal, which is to combine the global with the local. And innovation because this is not research, I think. Research has limitations because it ends where knowledge is produced and published. So we need to be careful with the use of the word research because research is putting money to generate knowledge. What happens with the knowledge? Most people don't care. Innovation, and I learned that from Julio Lorca, inspired by Esko Ahok, who was the president of Finland, who led a commission for the European Union on innovation, is to take knowledge as the resource to generate value to society. Okay. So radical global innovation. So imagine a team of hooligans from anywhere in the world, the best that are lo available locally with the best from around the world, imagining ideal futures and trying to create prototypes of that future in places that are willing to act as the petri dishes of what we really need. Okay. So we created simulators of the future in Toronto. This is the first one, the Center for Global Health Innovation, one-way mirrors. And as you can see, there is a bedroom there with a, with a hemodialysis machine. But this room was just like a little movie set. And we shoot a lot of movies in Toronto. So we brought movie people to work with us so we can assemble anything in less than two hours with two people, any scenario. Yeah? And then we invited, we joined forces with the public. And people get to experience the future and guide us into the kind of future that we need to develop. Okay, it's a member of the general public, the one who is going to be affected most by what we do, who determines where we go with our, you see, role as companions, not telling people what they need. And we do this together. Now this is led by Joe Cafaso, who is a wonderful colleague, biomedical engineer who did his PhD uh, with me. Okay? And then that motivated other things. These are other facilities we have in Toronto where we can simulate or, almost anything, weather conditions, um, we can freeze the streets. Okay? We can get you to fall, all sorts of things. Okay? We just open a drive lab, lab to test uh, marijuana and driving. So we get people to smoke pot or to have medicinal marijuana. We simulate the streets and create different conditions now to guide legislation on, on how to introduce marijuana, for example, in society or new drugs or whatever. Hmm? But also to design uh, uh, products. We are working with shoe companies, we're working with architecture companies to minimize falls and that kind of things using these environments to simulate possible futures and working with people. Okay? I'm going to accelerate because probably um, I'm looking at the powers to be. Okay? Okay. So send me signals or throw me a tomato and I will get it. <laughs> and then we are creating multiple additional epicenters for the pandemic places where we could be very opportunistic to try things that no other places can do, and then join forces across these places. Because innovation is opportunistic. Okay? 
knowledge is available in abundance. But it's the local conditions that create, you see, the, the, the context in which new things can happen. And it occurred in Colombia, what I'm going to describe to you now. And it helped that the Minister of Health developed cancer last year in a, in a, in a, in a way. No? He's a good friend and colleague, but then he sent me tweets saying, I have cancer, I'm healthy. Viva la pandemia de salud. Hmm? He got it. So uh, in Colombia, we had the fortune to engage the, the Federation of Coffee Growers. This is the largest NGO in the world, ONG, NGO, uh, in the rural area, two million people. Okay? And this is an organization that celebrated 90 years last year. And they used to be in the health sector. They used to give donations to build hospitals, and give people hospital beds and pay salaries of physicians and nurses in rural communities and all that. And then the law in Colombia changed that made healthcare universally available. And then these organizations moved away from that. But then things started to get a little more complicated and organizations started to get worried about their own people and, and see what they can do. And instead of going to the field, to the coffee growing areas, we decided to focus on the house first. They have 3,000 employees and little more. Their own employees first. Instead of going to the coffee growers and telling them what they should do, they are in disadvantage. 90% of coffee growers in Colombia are poor. While the 3,000 people working at the corporate offices of the Federation all over the country, they are not poor. So we said instead of going straight to the field, and do more harm than good, let's develop things ourselves in the privileged side. Let's experiment with the privileged side and minimize the risk of experimenting with the less privileged side. Okay? So uh, you can see here the 90 years and Juan Valdez and all that, and decided to start working with them in a project called Harvesting Health, okay? Cosechando Salud. And we tried to create a virtuous cycle. So we started by making people aware. We run campaigns using email, using the, the company's website. This is eHealth. We are going to change the health system together. We invite you to be part of this. We want everybody to participate. Wait for a survey. We use the survey to generate baseline, okay, from the own community. First company we know in the world in which there are data on how healthy the workers feel. Then we identify needs and assets, health assets for the company, and then created individual and collective salutogenic portfolios. These are portfolios to create health. And we evaluated the impact that allowed us to, I'm going to go quickly here, um, to make decisions based on evidence, evidence of the own organization. And look at this data. All 3,442 employees received a survey by email. This is eHealth, okay? We're using digital technologies. 92% responded. We said, wow. Hmm? Our campaign using the web and engaging people and, and seducing them worked. 44, 94% considered themselves healthy. 94%, this is better than Canada in Colombia. We said, wow, president of the organization, we called him. You have a very healthy organization. This man who was supporting us, not knowing why, felt so proud. Our project became a flagship for the organization. Okay? I am the leader of a healthy organization. You know what that is? When, when in the world, 12% of people feel engaged in what they do. 142 countries surveyed about job engagement 12% of people feel engaged. And you have an organization in which 94% consider themselves healthy. And I'm glad you said we talked about that. Your organization is more than 90% engaged. So we have the CAUBE. Huh? We were talking about the other day about this. So there are organizations that are healthy, and they could be using this to say, hey, we are healthy. We'd like you to be healthy too. Hmm? And only four people reported bad health. The other said, my health is. Fair, okay, not poor. 
fair. Okay? So we focused on these four, enabled them to say good, very good, or excellent, and they can say now as a company, nobody in this company has bad health. And it's true. And suddenly they become the first company in which nobody has bad health working there or poor health. This is powerful rhetoric too, to get the organization to play as a partner. And then we collected 21,000 qualitative data points. Okay? And with a group of people led by Sara Espinal and David Rodriguez, two students from Colombia who came to Toronto with us, we analyzed the 21,000 pieces and created a, a categorization of the resources that people said that they need to be healthy. Because we went ahead, we said, how healthy are you? Boom. Why do you think you are healthy if you are healthy? Why do you think you are not healthy? And what would you need if you are healthy to continue to feel healthy? And what do you need if you are not healthy to be healthy? And people told us. And we analyzed that and identified an abundance of resources that the organization already had to satisfy the needs of their own people. But many of these resources were invisible to them. The organization didn't know that giving people a subsidy to finish their education could contribute to their health. Some people said, I don't feel healthy because I had to stop my studies to work. I had children, etc., etc., and it, it drags me down. Subsidies for education, they finished their degree, they became healthier. This is not pills, MRIs, waiting lists, operating theaters. And we created a very granular mapping resource using Google tools, okay? where leaders of the organization in any city could know what resources they had and enrich the portfolios of the employees, individual and collective. The fascinating thing was that when we asked the 200 and something people who felt that their health was poor or, 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 or fair, uh, what they needed, less than 1% needed medical things. Less than 0.7% were medical issues. This is huge. Because even if it is 10%, even if it is 15%, multiples of that, is nowhere near where we are now, where we have medicalized everything. We almost have a code for every human challenge, and there is a pill for that or a device for that. When we look at it from the medical lens or an illness, this is sense. And I'm going to stop here because this is the approach. We said, let's try to prevent the preventable. Let's try to make possible the possible, not to make possible the impossible. There are lots of things that could happen that we are not making happen. So let's make happen what we know we could make happen. Let's make visible the invisible. Because by making it visible, we can make it available for you to satisfy your needs. And let's prepare for the inevitable, for the things we cannot fix. A death, the loss of a limb, a separation, etc. And then we started to mobilize the assets of the organization. They had gyms. We started to connect that with health. And I have many examples. We prescribed homes to people. You are living with your, your in-laws. You just got married. You don't have money for a house. You have to be in a room living with your father-in-law and your mother-in-law, and they are making your life miserable. You are not healthy. What do you need? A home. And they had organizations called Cajas de Compensación in Colombia that provide subsidies for housing. And we had a ceremony, which was a graduation as a healthy person. And we prescribed the, I prescribed homes to people and cars and motorbikes and subsidies for education. So prescriptions by the health team of the organization became different. Not antidepressants, ansiolytics, OK? Because you're feeling down, you're burning out. Yeah, you, are, you cannot even have sex because your room is by your mother's room. And they may hear you at night, OK? That's the kind of situations we found. Okay? And then some people said, I need to give more. I don't find a lot of meaning on what I'm doing. So we found foundations available to give people the opportunity to serve. I love to teach. OK, teach. And we created opportunities for them to be connected with the community and to do things that fulfill them. Most of the resources we found were already available. 
and we use technology to match people with needs and resources. <laughs> E-health on my books. No apps, no gadgets, no intelligent platforms, no smart stuff, no algorithms, no machine learning, no artificial intelligence. <laughs> Almost zero investment. And we published a book. There is a copy here for any of you who may want to see it. And this is a book with uh, 23 authors, 17 chapters, 482 pages, English and language simultaneously, <coughs> where we describe the experience. It will be in Spanish and English separately very soon on Amazon, but we, I can give you the PDF to any of you for free. Don't buy it, OK? Because the money will be made. Am I being recorded? Um, by somebody else who we don't know what intentions they have, OK? And, um, and by the way, the students were editors. Sara Espinal, David Rodriguez, the two students just graduated from political sciences at the University of Columbia, editors of a book. Kay Van Nguyen, the doctoral student worker with me, editor of a book. Three of the six editors, students. as it should be. And now we are moving to the next stage, which is now to engage the coffee growers. And half of the coffee growing families are in post-conflict zones after a war. You see, Colombia, we signed the peace deal. Half, one million coffee growers have been in areas where it has been difficult for the government to go and for the health system to reach. That's creating an opportunity for us to think with these communities how to do stuff and how to reinvent the system with them leading the process. And we are focusing on young people and old people and on social entrepreneurship. How can we enable the creation of enterprises by the community with solidarity economics, OK? Shared economics, alternative economic models, ideally led by those who are more, most disadvantaged. And we are preparing for massive social change, OK? Because and we are focusing on the workplace now in this particular context because now as machines are starting to replace us, we're using this work to try to figure out what's next, how a post-work world should look like and how to make it happen because for most people, work sucks. Okay? And most wellness programs in organizations are there to make us feel less miserable, not to make us feel better. It's to reduce our level of misery so we can keep producing stuff. Hmm? So we are trying to create health, create happiness, create joy, create, create fulfillment while we get rid of work. And only people who love what they do would continue to work, but nobody would be a slave. That's our big dream. And we also, and I'm finishing now, would like to suggest flipping things. In the world of evidence-based medicine, in which I developed a lot, spent most of my life before this, it was, I need to see to believe. Show me the evidence. We're looking backwards. Show me the evidence. You already generated it. Let's do systematic reviews. What happened in the past to guide our future? Let's complement that with the opposite approach. Let's believe in a better future. Let's think about a better future. If we believe that things can be different, we might be able to see many opportunities that are invisible now. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Martha. Martha Eimerich, and um, I'm the vice director for research at the UOC at the uh, Universidad de Verde de Catalunya, at the same time as president of the eHealth Center at the UOC. So uh, we are now to uh, switch to the, the second or the, f the, the first session after this uh, wonderful opening session by Alex Jadad, already our honoris causa, Waki, as he likes to say, our Waki at our university. So now, uh, after his opening session, we are mo we are moving to uh, the first session about health data science. So let me introduce a stain alive scrap set. He's the director of the New Region Center for eHealth Research, 
Uh, he holds a master's degree and a PhD in mathematical physics from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology in Trondheim, uh, Norway. Uh, has been a postdoctoral fellow, visiting researcher at Sydney, also at IBM Watson Research Center at uh, uh, New York. And uh, he has led several research projects on medical statistics, medical image analysis, machine learning, pattern recognition, and data analysis. So, uh, Stainalaf will deliver now um, and, uh, 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 a, a session about building learning healthcare systems from big data, challenges and promises. So, thank you very much for being here with us and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can you hear me? No? Yeah. There we go. Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here. It's uh, uh, my first time uh, presenting for uh, or being hosted by Open University of Catalonia, so I'm glad to be here. Uh, coming from Tromsø, which is in the far north uh, part of Norway, for those of you who don't know where that is. Uh, you can complain about the weather here today. I can assure you that uh, <laughs> I've seen worse. <laughs> Uh, I also have one of my colleagues here in the audience, uh, Elia Gabaron, who will also host the panel later today. So there are two of us. She's local, though, not originally from Tromsø. So is my presentation coming up? Yeah. Talking about, uh, we heard a little bit about machine learning and, and these kind of things uh, earlier today. I wanted to start out by a story that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in, uh, a couple of years back. Uh, the story was about a little girl, 13 years old, and I'm not a medical doctor, so I can't properly explain the medical situation, but she had a set of complex uh, conditions. Uh, it was a difficult case for the doctors, and the specific question they asked was, um, should we give this girl anticoagulants for her condition? And they didn't know, uh, the team of doctors didn't know. They went to the literature and they could find no supporting evidence for this particular case. So what they did then was to go into the uh, EHR, the electronic health record for this, uh, for this uh, hospital. This was at Stanford. Um, and they looked through and searched. It was very much work to search through to find similar cases, something that could inform them about the current case. They found roughly 100 cases. And based on that, they concluded that they should give this girl anticoagulants, and, uh, uh, and it seemed to work. That girl was fine. Um, the point of the story isn't the medical condition itself, but it's that it took so much time, so much effort, so much labor to actually do this which is in the age of Google and uh, everything else we have, sounds trivial, right? You should just look it up. But it was a very difficult case, and it took so much effort to, to actually figure it out. And, and they concluded uh, in their story that did, did we do the right thing here? There was no way of knowing, of course. The girl was fine, but was that because of the treatment we gave her? We don't know. But we did the best we could based on the evidence we had, and the evidence we had happened to be a very comprehensive EHR system at that particular hospital. Um, there we go. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> now this one isn't working. Turn it off and on again, is that what the trick? No? This doesn't. There we go. Okay. Now I think we're all set. So this was the story I just uh, talked to you about, and, and it's, it's something that should be really trivial, right? This is what we should have with a, any HR system, really, but it should be able to inform us about the data that we have, because we have a lot of data, and do something with it, something meaningful that actually provides us with insight that helps us improve uh, patient treatment. Um, oops, I was going too far. 
The learning healthcare system is part of my title. This is a very simplistic sketch of the learning healthcare system. Um, there is a lot more to it than this, but the idea is that this is the way we have been doing it for a long time. It works, it's fine. It's that we do clinical practice. This clinical practice generates some kind of knowledge which we inform hypotheses about how the world works, how does the human condition work, how, how does medicine work. And then we can test it out in clinical trials, we can do lots of them, we can do reviews, uh, et cetera, and bring that in, uh, knowledge that we gain here back into clinical practi practice. This is a cycle that takes approximately 17 years, according to some numbers. It will vary, of course, depending on the case, but on average, it's, it's in that ballpark. So we know it works. This is the kind of, of a way we've been doing it for, for a long time, but 17 years is a long time, so it's a big danger that by the time this knowledge gets back to the cl clinical practice, clinical practice has already changed so much so that information is actually irrelevant. On the other side, we have the immediate cycle where we use the data that we get from the clinical practice. We take that and synthesize it in some way. We analyze it and bring it back immediately. This is immediate, it's automated in the ideal case, but it involves three very, very difficult steps. It means getting data in a way that we can use them, that it can inform us of something. And there are also lots of legal restrictions in this step, there are lots of other technical uh, challenges. And then when we have the data, we need to synthesize knowledge from that. That's a really hard step. This is the analytics part. And then when, since when we have that knowledge, we bring it back somehow in the form of decision support or, or some other means that is also highly non-trivial. So this is so, sort of a, again, simplistic, but it's a vision of a learning healthcare system that involves some very difficult steps. And I will specifically talk about the two first ones here. There are lots of things we can do with this prevention, Monitoring. Uh, monitoring is becoming a, a big thing now that we're all, is, hospitals are overburdened, the healthcare system is overburdened. Um, we need to have patients or citizens in their homes longer. Monitoring and using the data that you get from, uh, from devices at home. Then do predictive analytics to improve outcomes and do quality improvement. This is an example uh, of uh, diagnosis of heart disease based on uh, EHR data. Where when it started out, this is work that was done at I IBM while I was working with them. Um, when it starts out with the knowledge features, that is things that we already know, and you try to inform the, 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 the diagnostic process, and up here is the area on the curve, so that is how precise are you. And by the time you taken everything you know, all the knowledge features that you can think about, you add in here hypertension and diabetes and etc. then you have an accuracy that is in the range of 62% or something like that. Then you start adding machine learned features, things that aren't obvious. You combine things, you, you, you seek out things that aren't obvious. Then you all of a sudden, by the time you reach 200 more features, you're up to over 75% accuracy. Using data can improve these kind of problems dramatically. But, there is a big but here. This kind of processes are, we talk a lot about machine learning, and as I mentioned in the previous presentation too. There is a lot of talk about machine learning, artificial intelligence, etc., etc. Um, in general, it's being used by a lot of companies uh, that have interest in selling things. And when you bring that back into a realistic world, it turns out it doesn't always work that well. I will go into more details about that. Um, one of the key points is that machine learning, so it's learning a pattern based on data. This is a simple example where you have two dimensions, you have some data points, some of them are blue and some are orange whatever that is, and you try to infer some kind of boundary between those two classes. That's a very simple case of machine learning. 
And then as you add more data points, you can get this to adjust, so it can adjust, it can learn over time how this boundary is. The, you never have a case like this. There's never two dimensions. There is a million dimensions. You don't have two clearly defined classes, et cetera. To inform me about the problem so that you can map it down to something that's manageable is domain expertise. And this is so important. You can't, you can never take a data set and start to analyze it without discussing it with those who generated the data. In our case, we've been working a lot with uh, people at the gastrointestinal surgery department. They gave us some data. We started to look at them and we re realized that we can't make sense of this data without going back and talking to you. You have to talk us through what this actually means. Not only that, but they have to talk about the specifics of actually what is every single um, feature we're talking about here. There's so many discrepancies, there's so many details that you need to address that you can get nowhere without talking to those people. And then they also have to tell you what the problem actually is. They will tell you in a very quick sentence, well, the problem is you have to distinguish these two cases. What does that mean? How do I find that in the data? How do, where, where, where are the gray, gray, there is always a gray scale here. Where, where do we put the boundary, et cetera? You absolutely get nowhere without engaging clinicians in this kind of uh, work. It's often said that more data always trumps a clever algorithm. That is true to some extent. More data is, is usually better, but there are many cases where that isn't true. Um, if there are inherent biases in the data, they will only get worse if you get more data. You will be more and more sure about something that is, in, that is completely wrong. And machine learning predicts. You can predict things, you can do predictive analytics, but it says absolutely nothing but causality, what causes one thing or another. Causality is a very difficult subject here because it's, it's so hard to inform you about causality. It's often said the only way you can say something about causality is to do a randomized control trial. That is not actually true. There are other ways to infer causality. But in general, machine learning doesn't say, tell you anything about causality. But often that doesn't matter. It's not causality that you're actually interested in. You're not always interested in whether one thing causes another. It's fair enough to know that they are correlated. There is some kind of connection between those two things. I don't like to talk about big data. It's one of these buzzwords these days. Everyone wants to talk about big data. I think it's a highly misleading term, especially in some contexts it's fine. But in much of what we're doing, big data is actually not a very good descriptor because it puts that, all that emphasis on big. Big isn't the point. You can have very small data sets that still have the characteristics and you use the same methods as you would with real big data, if you want to call it that. The point of, of, of this field is that you combine several sources. You don't have one clean data set. You don't have an Excel table of this is what you want to, to analyze. You have several different things. You have some free text, you have some images, you have some lab results, you have some social media data, you have some sensor data. You have all these different information about a patient, a condition, something that you want to, to inform you about, and, and they're not clean. You need to assemble them somehow. You need to combine them. Another characteristic is that there are always quality concerns. Is the data good enough? They usually aren't. That's the big dirty secret, I guess. They usually aren't good enough. You need to address that question. You need to ensure that the data actually supports the conclusions that you're making or the address the question that you're asking. There are always inherent biases, always. You just need to find them, and you won't find them all. A lot of data is unstructured. 
for example, text and images is unstructured, you need to understand what are you going to do about that. That's not easy. And we call them complete. That is in the sense that we take all the data that we can have access to. We don't, we don't do, when you do a randomized control trial, you need to write a protocol, you need to specify exactly what kind of data you're, you're getting, you need to say exactly what are you going to do with that data, et cetera. In the big data context, what you do is you assemble everything you can get hold of and then see what you can get out of it. That doesn't mean you know the whole story though. Don't mistake complete for complete in the sense that it tells you everything because it doesn't. Um, this area is plagued by a good deal of hype. This is the Gartner hype cycle. Uh, I guess many of you have seen that before. It's the cycle that most new technologies go through over time. So you start out here with some kind of innovation trigger. And at, the point, at this point, we have something called smart dust here. I have no idea what that is. Um, then it goes through a peak of inflated expectations where, where, it's, um, where there is a lot of hype, there is a lot of belief in this technology, it's a lot of expectations of what can be done here, everything can be solved at this point. Then you realize that's not true and you get into the trough of dis disillusionment and then you slowly get up to the realistic level. Uh, of what you actually can do. So you get a slope of enlightenment and a plateau of productivity where, is, where the technology is stable and you, and you understand what you're going to do about it. So what is interesting here is that at the very top, you have machine learning and deep learning. They're right there. Down here in the decline, you have cognitive computing, you have blockchain, uh, that is going down, you have augmented reality, which is now at the very bottom, and virtual reality is, is now coming towards its, its uh, plateau of productivity. You can always discuss, of course, where if, why, uh, why anything is where it is on this scale, but it's still very interesting, I think, that machine learning is at the very top here. Machine learning, one of the reasons for that is that there are big commercial interests in this field. I have worked with IBM, I'll get back to that in a minute. Um, you have Google, you have Facebook, you have Apple, you have Amazon, all these big actors whose interest it, it, it is in actually selling and to some extent overselling their technology. That means that you get an impression that this can actually solve everything. You can just pull data together and plug it into these magical machines and you get an answer out that it will tell you what you actually need to know. It doesn't work like that. And that's what we're going to realize through this process going down here. That doesn't mean that this is useless technology. That's not my message. It is really powerful technology that is going to help us, but we need to be realistic about it. Up here is also together with machine learning, you have deep learning. Deep learning is a term that's come up in the last few years, but it's, it's really not all that new. The te technology was discovered way back, I think, uh, in the uh, uh, 70s something. Then it was called neural networks. It was meant as a way to emulate how the brain works. Then one realized that that wasn't really a very useful way of thinking about things. Uh, so it was put to the shelves also because one didn't have the computing power to actually do it. It's re-emerged now as deep learning because we have the computer technology, but also because the algorithms have improved a lot. So you can have deep learning because it's, it tells you every layer in those neural networks informs you about the process that's going on. So in that sense, it sort of mimics how a brain works. But that is also still, but that's been very rapidly increasing over the last couple of years. Uh, so, so, uh, so this is also something that is, is coming, but it's still also going to go through this disillusionment phase, I'm sure. Um, said that we're drowning in data. But one, the first question one asks when one starts into this field, but where is the data? How can I get to it? I can't, I can't see it anywhere. Um, 
IBM has, has put up this, uh, which tells you something about potential. Uh, 4.9 million patients use remote monitoring devices. That's a lot of data. Um, you have a lot of unstructured data. You have patient monitoring equipment in hospitals. Uh, you have a lot of data that goes into, uh, into the prov provision of healthcare. But usually it's not very available to you. Uh, getting access to data is a, is a very tough problem, actually. And we need to be aware of that. Often it is legislation that is, I shouldn't call it a problem, because leg legislation is there for a very good reason. Uh, but that is one of the barriers to actually getting the data. Um, and uh, I can't talk for many other countries in Norway, but in Norway at least, legislation is old. It's been there for a long, long time. And it's not thought about these kind of uses for data when it was written. So that means there is processes starting to, to look into it and go through legislation to see what the government do. And then there's, there's the technical problem. The first time I were, or not the first time, but one of the biggest projects I worked on this, uh, we were getting data from the hospital that we're actually part of. The process of legislation and getting legal access to the data, that was fine. We managed to do it. The biggest problem was the technical side of it because the EHR system wasn't prepared for this. It, it, it just wasn't any way of getting the data out with that lot of hard work from the IT people. So getting access to data is a big issue. I feel like I'm painting a very gloomy picture here now. So I'm going to make it a bit gloomier. Um, this is one example that we, should, we have learned a lot from. This is from February, from 2014 in, in, in science. Uh, Google flu, a lot of you probably heard about it. Um, it started out that Google wanted to say something, wanted to predict the flu season based on what people search for. Sounds like it a reasonable project to do, especially for Google, who has a lot of data. They have a lot of brilliant people who can sit down and, and do this. And they did it, and they did it fairly well. Uh, the orange curve here is the Google flu predictions, and, uh, and uh, the, um, what do you call it, bluish, uh, is, is the, actual, uh, the actual count. Um, it went fine in the beginning, but then, after a couple of seasons, it actually started to overestimate. And it overestimated consistently too high for two years. Until this flu season, the 2012 one, it dramatically overestimated, more than double. That's pretty much useless for an algorithm like that. You, you don't get any meaningful from that. What was the reason for this? There are several reasons that are outlined in this, in this article. One of the reasons is that they didn't adjust the algorithm for Google Flu, but they did a lot of adjustments to the Google itself algorithm, which means it changed the basic data that they were, they were harvesting into their own algorithm, and they didn't adjust for it. They also did, they took in a lot of data that was obviously irrelevant. Basketball results. They just pulled all the data together and see what they could find out of it. There was no guidance as to what, rel what data is actually relevant here. Which means that the Google flu was actually much more of a winter predictor than a flu predictor. We don't really need a winter predictor. We know when it's coming. This stopped the project in 2013. But there are important lessons to learn from this. A more current one is IBM. And I should, I should say outright that I have worked with IBM. I've spent a year there, and I know that a lot of people who work there are brilliant. I know that the basic algorithms are very, very good. But something went wrong along the way. This article, I guess a lot of you have heard about it and maybe even read it, uh, came out uh, last fall. Uh, and it's very, very critical of IBM Watson or Watson Oncology specifically. 
um, it doesn't perform very well. It's not very useful in many cases. Uh, one of the big reasons for that, uh, there are a lot of reasons. This is a very long article. I have a lot of things. I can't go possibly go through them all. But one interesting one is that Watson Oncology was trained by doctors, not by a team of worldwide doctors, as is often perceived in people's mind. It was trained by a handful of doctors at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Hospital in New York. It's one of the top cancer sensor centers in the world. They have the best oncologists, I'm sure. But when you try to take something that was trained by Memorial Sloan Kettering and put it into a hospital in Denmark, it doesn't work. It's not the same setting. It's not the same healthcare system. You don't pay for things the same way. It's not the same kind of patients. The demographic is, is completely different. There are a lot of factors that are different. And Watson, it doesn't completely ignore it, but it doesn't take it enough into account to make it useful in that different setting. You have to work with the domain experts. And in this case, the domain experts is not only Denmark, it's tried out several other places with similar results. Um, but the domain experts in this case would be in Denmark, not in New York. Despite the, the New York the New York oncologists possibly being better in some sense than the Danish ones, but they ignore the context. Doing things like this is harmful. It's harmful for the way we, we do research is harmful for the way, it's, the way these kind of technologies is perceived because it's certainly overselling the technology. And, and it's, it's harmful for, it's of course harmful for IBM, but it's harmful for the entire field. This is one of the reasons that we're now going down into that disillusionment. I won't spend much time on this. This is a bit more technical, it's, uh, but um, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, not, it's often not big data, it's long and thin data. It's because you have very often, when you try to collect data, especially in the medical domain, you have relatively few patients. I mean, you can have hundreds or maybe even thousands of patients, but you have a lot more features. Try to collect text. How many words are, is written about a complex patient in the electronic health record? How many features can you get, generate from that? You can generate millions of features. That means that you have a lot more features than you have patients. These tables become very long and thin. And when you have that many data points, you can always fit a curve to it. With When you have that many uh, features, that means a lot of degrees of freedom when you do your algorithms, which means that you can fit almost any data perfectly with your algorithm and say, hey, look what we can predict, it's perfect. When in reality, uh, the true signal is much more difficult to extract. We've done some work on this. As I mentioned, we've been working with the gastrointestinal uh, surgery department to predict uh, complications after surgery. In this case, we used free text uh, to, to uh, was published in Nature Scientific Reports last year, where we use free text. We could uh, plug that into mesh terms and we see how patients go through different stages uh, through their patient trajectory, try to predict that, and, and developing this further. Is, is a target to, um, to uh, have decision support for the doctors so that they can uh, be informed about when complications occur before so you can stratify patients or however you want to do it. Um, another way of engaging clinicians is interactive visual analytics. This is something I, I believe strongly in, that you can build tools Together, that enables you to sit down with clinicians and work with them and look at data. In this case, there are, patient, there are patterns. You need, to in, you need to work your way through this a little bit to understand how it works. But once you do that, you can click through the data. You can see how patterns emerge. You can, and then when you do this, as a data scientist, it doesn't make sense to do this. But 
it makes sense because you can, it enables you to sit down with the clinicians and they can explore the patterns together with you and tell you what is nonsense, something is always nonsense, what is meaningful and what is surprising. It can be surprising because it's wrong or it can be surprising because it's new information, it's novel information that it can really use for some. We did some work on how, inf how much information content is there in medical tests. Um, based on, on this work, I, I don't have time to go into the details, of course, but it says that this particular test has a certain information content. It's no use in, in doing it at the time of surgery. It doesn't inform you about anything uh, for, for one particular purpose. But doing it, uh, what is this, three days after surgery, then it informs you a lot about about the outcome. In this case, it was um, re-surgery, I think that was the outcome. Um, it informs you a lot about that. So if you want to know something, then you should do it at this point. The information content is bigger. That you can only do based, this can do based on, on medical tests. Uh, and, and as you can sort of guess out of this complex diagrams, there's a lot of data that goes into, uh, into this uh, algorithm to make these kind of uh, to, to infer this kind of things. So, some summaries. Um, we have lots of data. How do we get access to it as a key point? Machine learning and artificial intelligence have a great potential in healthcare, but there are a lot of pit pitfalls. And we sh that based on that, I think we should start slowly. We have started slowly. A lot of people are doing it. Uh, but the big, huge projects we might not be ready for quite yet. We must work together. Different fields must come together around the same table, sit and work together to understand this. Uh, and unstructured data holds much of the information, but it requires analytics that is rather complicated. That was what I had to say. Uh, I don't know if I'll take questions now or we'll save it for the panel. We'll take it for the round table. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Good morning. My name is Manolo Armayones. I am trying to, I am the development director of the e-health center. I am trying to help to infect other e-health center, academic and research e-health center around the world with this wonderful um, love virus that we try to spread um, around the world. The next speaker will be my colleague here in the European University, Carmen Carrion, is researcher at the Health Center and professor at the York Faculty of Health Science and Knowledge Area Coordinator at the Health Center. Please, do you have one minute? No, sorry, I, do, do you have? <laughs> it's gonna be more than one minute. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Manolo. Uh, before to start, uh, you know a lot of us, about us, the people who are speaking here, but we don't know a lot about you. So it's going to be, I think, interesting to know the backgrounds of the people in the room. So I would like to please uh, show people who has a background in health science. So medical science, nursing. Okay. What about a basic science uh, background, like chemistry, physics, maths, biology? Okay. Uh, those in the background in engineering and, and uh, technology. Okay. Um, social science. Okay. And humanities. Okay. <laughs> so it's very interesting to see that there are people from very different backgrounds together in the room. So it means that e-health is completely, completely multidisciplinary uh, topic. And, and that's great, I think. So, let's start with the presentation. Oops, sorry, this is not my presentation. <laughs> okay. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, a long, long time ago, somebody like Albert Einstein already said something like that, that it has become appealing obvious that our technology has exceed our humanity. I don't know what would he said nowadays after everything that we are living now. If we look at the 
um, development of, of uh, something very, very easy for everybody, as like the telephones, we can see how they have changed and I, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. How are we going to communicate in the future? We don't know about that. But these kind of things are already happening. So social networks are even giving us the, 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 the facility to, to, to record something like the birth of a, of, a, of, a, of a son, of a daughter, which is something which is great for somebody. And you want everybody in the world to know it and you share it in your social network. We can talk about ethics, we can talk about a lot of things, but it is, this is real, this, this happens, okay. So I'm gonna mix up mHealth and eHealth several times because somehow it's gonna be the same thing in, in, or it's already the same thing somehow. So what's the state of the art? Now, again, I want to know something about you. So as we've been sitting for a long time, I would like you to a, lit, a little bit of movement before the coffee break. And I would like to know he, who of you has got a smartphone with you now. Can you please stand up? <laughs> stand up, please. <laughs> OK, I think that's almost 100%. This survey is going to be biased completely, but I think it's going to be like a kind of picture of what's going on here. Uh, who has a health app in the, in the smartphone? Please stand up. The others, you can already sit down. OK. 80%, 85 uh, Who is currently using them? I mean, who has been using this health app for the last week? Please stand up. OK, like 50%, quite a lot. Eh? And who is using also sensors and wearables in relation with these health apps? Please stand up those who are using them. Wow, not bad, eh? Like 30%. Thank you, you can sit down, all of you. Now we could continue our study just asking the qualitative part of the study. So why are you using these sensors, these apps, these wearables? Why are you using them? Maybe we can ask on our own why are we using that? Or why did we stop using them? Because it also happens, people use them and finally after several months, they decided to stop with that. So, uh, if we want mHealth to give some impact in our health, as Professor Jadad was saying, we need to know what do we have, which, which are the inputs we have now. And what we have is like, like a big bubble of opportunities. So we have uh, like thousands and hundreds of thousands of different apps and possible interventions. And we have a lot of expectations in terms of money, as we've said before. And what's the situation in 2017? It is said that there are like 320, uh, sorry, 325,000 health apps, no matter where you look at the, at the survey or um, a, a report, you will find different data, but that means there's a lot, probably too many. And so there's a lot of money invested in that. And as it was, it, it has been said, like it's a thing that can give us opportunity to have a very big business around health. Uh, in the eHealth survey from HIMSS, uh, what can we see? We can see the, the situation about eHealth in Europe for, and this, this is for uh, fall 2017, so, so it's quite new. Uh, what they say, it's not in, in relation to mHealth, but more to, to eHealth, is that uh, health IT is not enough supported by, 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 I mean, by governments in Europe. And also uh, that the focus is still, it's not new, it's still focusing in electronic medical records. This is something that I've been listening for the last years. Very interesting things and more and more the e-health seems to shift towards the patient and I would like to add not towards the, the patient only but towards the citizen. And um, that the electronic me medical records are more common nowadays, although they are still a challenge, uh, they are more common than the paper ones. And the uh, e-health professionals, I like this idea of e-health professionals, but as uh, Dr. Jadad was saying, it's health professionals, in fact, in the future, or we hope it's going to be soon, want to improve their leadership skills. So it seems that e-health professionals tend to be 
a kind of cluster of people, those freaky people who like technology, working in a hospital and that's all. But it's not really integrated in the health organizations and even less in the health system. So bearing all these things in mind, there are a lot of concerns of what, what should we do with that? There are a lot of apps, a lot of money behind it, a lot of expectations, but then our health system, our health organizations are not really changing. Uh, but so it's a challenge, it's a danger, it's an opportunity, what, what we are facing. And so there are a lot of regulatory bodies who try to, to set up uh, frameworks, set up recommendations, even rules in order to try to put a little bit of order in all this issue, which is not really easy, in fact. So what are the outcomes expected? So as, as it has been said already, a lot of expectations. So there are a lot of uh, the eternal promise, no? like some of the, I don't know, football players, which are always the eternal promise. Maybe we are now in front of the apps facing this, but also, there are a lot of expectations about changing the relation between health professionals and uh, patients. What about wearables? Will they change the future of healthcare? It seems that they are not doing till now, but what's going to happen in the future? What about big data? That's, again, something that uh, I don't know if it's in the top of the curve that uh, Dr. Stein showed us, but yeah, I think it's, everybody talks about big data, although most of the people don't know what does it mean. And this is from the Mobile World Congress two years ago. I was, I was surprised to, to see this, no? because success means years of life. Okay, maybe success means years of good life. I think we all, all will, will agree on that, okay? But so what's really going on? We have a society with problems with obesity. We have a society with smoking problems. We have a society with sitting down all the time and not having a sedentary life. So we have all these things which are so easy to manage that maybe most of the apps are focused on that, but are really changing habits and are really being successful on that? Not that much. Why? So we have a lot of uh, possible answers to that. One of these is that maybe there are a lot of stakeholders around uh, the, the, the issue of the M health, and we don't know how to work together yet. And we have different interests and we come from different backgrounds and we speak different languages and it's very difficult sometimes like a, a common oops, sorry <laughs> like a common aim and this common aim i think should be to improve health of people also again this thing about the adoption group about technology that i think most of you have uh, heard about it so not everybody is ready to use the same kind of technology for the same purposes and also based in, 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 in one survey that, that it's from, I think, 2014, so quite three, four years ago, it says that one of the problems that we have with apps is that they, they have a problem in quality. They are not good quality. That means maybe not enough based in evidence. Maybe the data they are collecting is not really a feasible data. So these kinds of things are potential problems. Integration about what do we do with our smartphone and our apps? Do we go to our medical, to our physician and say, okay, I've recorded all this uh, data from my performance in my daily life. Is it really useful for them? Is it integrated in the medical health record? That's again a challenge and there are a lot of projects trying to, 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 to do that this happened. And as I said before, collaboration uh, between professionals. So we have things like this one here an editorial from the British Medical Journal 2015 saying, which app should I use? Which app, sh which app should I use as a patient, as a, as a citizen, but also at the same time? Which app should I recommend to my patient being physician? Because this is also now in the offices of, of physicians, okay? Somebody is using an app to, quit to skip smoking, another one is using another app. Which is the best one? Why using an app? Is it really necessary? So you see, uh, my presentation is more uh, making questions than giving answers because the thing is not easy. Uh, one aspect that can be relevant to, and it's a clue to maybe improve the quality, for instance, uh, is what about the user experience? It's, sometimes it happens that it's changing, but sometimes it happens 
that those who are developing an app, they think, oh, this is really nice, this is cool, this, this will look really fancy, but then the user doesn't need this such fancy thing and needs something very simple. So let's integrate the final users from the beginning of the design of whatever M Health app or even e health intervention we are defining. Again, is there a lack of innovation in science? I don't think so. Maybe there is a lack of innovation in the healthcare as, and when I'm talking about healthcare, I mean in the organization, in the way the healthcare system is organized. It seems hospitals are not really that different in terms of how they are managed and organized for the last 50 years. Maybe there's a lot of more computers, more machines, more technology, but what happens with these machines and this technology. Is this something added to what was done before? So it's for the, for the medical doctors, it's like having more work to be done, more difficult things to be done. How is it really changing the, the organization in terms of the, of the professional life of the people working there, but also in terms of the patients being there? So it's clear that the health system needs a change of paradigm. I'm not the first one to say that, I think. But when we are talking about the change of paradigm, we are really talking about a disruptive change, a real disruptive change. It's not moving from a, from a disc to a CD, but going to a different business model as Spotify has been for the music, for, for the music uh, model. There are a lot of definitions of different people who thinks more than me and knows a lot more than me about what's old medicine and what's new medicine, and I would say what's health and not also new medicine. So the features that we are focusing, what society really needs, what people really need, and what we are we really to give to them is changing a lot. And technology should be a tool to help us. Of course, there are a lot of dangers, as Professor Jadad was saying, in, in technology, but, but there are a lot of challenges and there are a lot of expectations that can make our life easier. And that's, that's the question. So. Based on all this, should we really assess these M Health apps? Should we really help in the, with the assessment process to define interventions which are more uh, useful and which are better and which are having a bigger impact in society? I think yes, but maybe other people think no. Uh, every year in February here in Barcelona because of the Mobile World Congress, there are a lot of articles in newspaper which give us clues about what's, what's on, the, on, on the street, what's in the, in the bar, in the coffee break, people talking about. One thing is, should these apps uh, be regulated because they are collecting data? Uh, but on the other hand, if we regulate something that's gonna stop innovation process, that's gonna be a problem for investors, that's gonna be like a barrier for keeping on creating new things, uh, the first experience I know about the SESMA health uh, apps, uh, it comes from the um, agency, agency in Andalusia, and they already did it in, 20, in, in 2010. And it was like a starting point, a kickoff, just to start to give like, in fact, recommendations. If you want to have this term of distinctive uh, healthy app, um, you need to follow a specific clues, which are not really that difficult, but is the first, I think it's, it's very important to have this first uh, overview of what are we expecting from these M-Health apps. And, but what has happened since uh, 2010 till now? In, U in UK, the national health system has been trying to, to, give, to bring light to this assessment of apps for several years, they had, they used to have a kind of repository where they had their apps there, but it's finished. And they started a process of discussion with more than 2,000 people all over the country and different stakeholders involved in it, trying to define which are the, the gold standards for the apps. So the, the, the top aspects that we should consider just to recommend an app or not to recommend an app. They are still working in progress. And uh, they, uh, more or less, uh, to summarize what they, what they did, 
they give the stamp of uh, NHS approved if this app uh, is, has standards for safety, experience and effectiveness, considering safety, safety both in terms of uh, information, but also the clinical safety. And experience, very interesting, user-centered design, as I said before, integrating the final user from the beginning, accessibility and stability of the product, and effectiveness is really giving uh, final clinical outcomes that are really relevant. Is it, is it something having added value to what's done normally? So up to now, the only app that they have with this thumb, with I, I tested yesterday, so <laughs> it has not changed, I hope today, uh, there's one, only one app, is my COPD, uh, th that they have given this stamp of high quality, in fact. And then there are two others that are being tested in like more than 25 that are still in progress. So if we do this kind of uh, standards, which are too difficult to be reached, are the developers going to will to be really doing all this process to be approved by the national health system? We don't know about that. But even in the, in, in the UK, that I think in, they try to do things also very seriously, um, things are not solved yet. Here in Catalonia, most of you know about that. Uh, the, the Fundación Tic Salud is trying to, to now is piloting a kind of accreditation for, for the health apps. And the final um, aspect that they, they want to achieve is that data coming from these apps that are certified by, by Fundación Tic Salud or by the in fact, Catalan government uh, can be integrated in the medical health record. So that would be a step further, very interesting, but it's still work in progress also, as far as I know. So considering all these aspects, a, kind, a group of people coming from different organizations that we were worried and we are uh, more or less experts in assessment, we met together and uh, we tried to define a framework. Some people in the room has been participating in this framework and it, it will sound familiar to all of you. And we tried to define a, a framework which could be uh, useful for everybody. So finally we, we succeed in publishing it last, uh, last year. And what does the paper say? The paper say very, very, very um, logical things that could be useful for the model that in Fundación Tic Salud they are using, in the national health system they are using, and in whatever system. So things that should be like the, the basic of any uh, assessment process. First thing, is that it should have a multidisciplinary approach. I always use this, this um, image here because I like it a lot. This comes from a, a story, a very uh, old story from India, that a group of blind people were asked to identify what do, what do they have in front of them. And so they could just touch what they had in front of them, and some of them thought that it was like carpet, and other ones thought it was a snake or a, a tree, a stick, it was an elephant that nobody could see the whole picture because it was too big and, and they had not the experience of elephant before. So that's why it is very important to bear in mind all the different aspects which are present in when using or developing or assessing an app. Oops. So the other very important thing is not all the apps are the same. There are some apps which are risky because they are facing risky aspects in terms of the health of the people and the purpose of the apps are different. So we don't have to ask to all the apps the same conditions. So it's very interesting to classify them in, in terms of the risk they have behind and then decide which are the things that we are going to ask to each specific app. So, oops, this is a little bit uh, change of, uh, anyway. So the domains that we think should be evaluated are about the technical maturity, the risks, the resources needed to develop this app, and the benefits that it gives us. And there's a list of several subdomains that we've discussed together with a lot of people. And this is like, like the, 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 the idea that we want to achieve, but it's not for all the apps. So first thing is let's decide which is the risk behind this app, and let's decide which are then the domains and subdomains that are really needed to be assessed in that app. So this is a, a work to be done all together. The users, the developers, 
the, method, the people who is experts in methodology and people who is doing research. So recommendation coming from, the, from our consensus group was first, it's very interesting to define the purpose and intended use of the, of the app, to have tailored evaluation for each app depending on the taxonomy. Uh, evaluation needs a specific methodology that's a must and it's a must that it's not solved. There's research needed in methodology and tools. So methodology means tools. Which tools are we going to use to assess whatever domains and multi-domains? The process should be iterative and should, as it was said before, it should be adapted to every healthcare context. It's not the same Denmark than Canada, than Colombia, than Catalonia. It's completely different the way we are organized and the health system. And just to finish, I'm going to go very quick through five case studies uh, that also there are people here in the room that have been involved in some of them. That's going to be very, very quick just to, to, to explain you the lessons learned about that. The first one is the SICODEM. This is a clinical decision support system that we developed in 2012. And it was like a kind of small software to help, clinician, to help uh, health professionals to, record, to, to, to choose the best uh, intervention for people uh, suffering from dementia. This was a tool made because a group of experts decided that this was a need. And we did it our work together. And finally, we had a nice product, but it's not being used. Why? There's a lot of reasons. Maybe one of them is that we have not integrated the final users from the beginning. And this is a lesson learned for future projects that we are doing now. The second one is HT Dyslipemia. This is a platform that uh, we also were involved and it was done in a, in a specific hospital and there was a need from the medical doctors there, from the physicians there, about the side uh, effects and the problems in relation with epilepsia, uh, sorry, statins, drugs. So just to avoid uh, bad prescriptions or risky prescriptions, they wanted to have a kind of alert system and it was developed together, the clinicians there in the hospital together with engineers working there. So it's been used there in the hospital and it works. But when they wanted to scale it up and to offer to other hospitals, uh, there was no answer. So maybe it was not a need for the other hospitals or maybe this specific tool was only useful for that hospital. We don't know about that. But what we've learned is what uh, in, the, in the walk has been uh, started this year and is the experience about having the final users from the very, very beginning, from the defining even the research questions, which is not that easy for us researchers that we know what the society needs to include the final users from the beginning. So the experience is about opening health Parkinson, is gathering together uh, people suffering from Parkinson, uh, carers, formal and informal carers, physicians, nurses, and whoever is working with people suffering from Parkinson. And together they decided what could be a good solution to improve their quality of life. And based on that, there were some, some, um, some different projects presented. And finally, one of the projects was the winner. And it's now being developed in order to, to have something useful for the people. And it was like a request for the people. So we hope that's going to be a success. It, that's going to be useful, really useful and use it by the people who, who, who need it. Then I move to the fourth. Uh, experience and this is the Eva Labs project. This is a, a work, work on progress uh, project now. And we are trying to define a tool to try to assess uh, safety, efficacy, and effectiveness of those apps which are, which its main aim is to prevent obesity and overweight. What we've done up to now is a systematic review of evidence. What can we find is first that there are very few studies trying to do a good methodological work in assessing different domains and subdomains, including uh, what I was saying, safety and effectiveness. We are based on 20 studies, finally, and these 20 studies are not really high quality studies. So what have we found? What is people assessing in these studies? So engagement, usability, motivation, satisfaction, acceptability, in terms of what I call it outputs, 
in terms of outcomes, the typical things you would expect from an app that wants to prevent obesity or manage obesity and overweight, which is weight reduction, BMI, waist circumference, lipid composition, physical activity, sedentarism, diet, diet intake. So what we've learned of that, there are a lot of methodological limitations, there's a lot of heterogeneity, it's very difficult really to have a common picture of what's good for a, a, an, an app which wants to improve and ma the management of the, the obesity and overweight. And finally, uh, we are starting now to pilot the framework of M health assessment with a very specific organization, very small. This comes from a presentation that Marta did in Malta in the eHealth week, presenting the, the framework and then somebody say, hey, I have an app, I want to assess it and I want, based on this assessment, I want to improve this, its impact. And it's, this app is made by an, a small NGO in Denmark, and what they want is to improve the delivery in the low and middle income countries, and they are already using it. So it's gonna be kind of good uh, piloting for the framework to see how easy it is to, to, to use it and how easy, and, and if it's really useful in improving the final impact that we are looking for, and it's improving the quality and improving the, the, the final impact in health for the people using it. So. Finally, it seems that if we look at the whole picture of having apps, we are not doing but more and more in needs assessment and the design, centered uh, user design and, and working together. We develop, we know how to develop these apps. We know a lot about technology. We have a prototype, we make a first pilot. We try to validate it, that, that's getting, if we start with those who, who start uh, in the design, those who are validating it are not the 100%. The implementation process, it's not something really solved, but it, what it's not really solved nowadays is how we scale up this, in fact, in, in, in the way that we have a systemic solution, the impact that it's got and the systemic change. For, for sure, these are lacking points for, for all this end health strategy. And as I'm now in the university and I think the training people is very, very important to, to produce changes and to provoke changes. So what about training professionals? Which professionals should we train? We are a lot of people here from different backgrounds. So what we did, like one year ago, we started to interview several people coming from different backgrounds to say, hey, a professional who's gonna be working in e-health, what does he, she need to know? Or what does he, which are the competencies that he, she should have in order to be useful. So we finalized with this aim for a new master's degree that is gonna start in fall 2018. And it's acquisition of skills needed to detect, design, implement, use and assess possible technological solutions in health. So we are covering all the different stages in the health and the development. So, uh, the kind of contents that finally we are working on are the ones you have here. But assessment is gonna be a very, very important pillar of this. Implementation is gonna be a very important pillar as well. Impact, again, as well, and also, of course, information systems, of course, big data, and of course, patient empower, empowerment. I think everything can be wrapped up into these six, seven words which try to define what professionals need. And just to fin finalize, please do not forget about the face-to-face -face meetings. So sometimes technology make that we are not looking at the people that we have in front of us and things can be much easier than something that an app is saying to us. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Carmen, for this wonderful presentation. Now uh, we are a little bit in the late, like, like you know, we have 15 minutes to have, a, of course, Colombian coffee. Thank you. Yeah.